In this video, we are going to build a processor. And uh, this video covers everything important to understand how a circuit built from a logic gate can be transformed into a processor running software. At the beginning of this video, Steve is going to use a website to generate a simple processor core. He will explain how this processor core works and then we will build our own processor. Let's do it. Warp 5 is a CPU core. It's actually a CPU core generator. And we can see that core um, behaving right here, accessing instructions and uh, values from, from the register file, doing computations, and we'll talk more about this. We can design a simple CPU core depicted here or something that's more um, more toward what you'd see in a commercial setting depicted on the right. And I'm just going to quickly configure this with a simple core that we can play around with. So um, I'm going to keep this to a, a single cycle pipeline in case that means anything to you. We'll talk about that. And um, we're going to play around with a program that has some multiply instructions, which um, requires in this core an extension called a M extension, which gives us multiply and divide instructions. And I'm going to configure this so that we have a program that we can play around with and then open up this code in a platform called MakerChip. So you just created a processor? I just created a processor, a couple clicks, and this is all open source. Um, you can do this for yourself. I just went to warpv.org. That's all I did. And you can, you know, configure your core for these various options, uh, mm -hmm. including building a multi-core processor, even. Okay, so let's have a look what is inside. So of yeah, processor. let's let's take a look at this simple one-cycle core. So just to get a better understanding of what a CPU is, what a CPU core does, you know, how does, what's the magic behind writing a program in a, a higher level language like Python and executing instructions on a CPU? What's that hardware actually doing? So what we're seeing here is um, the, a, a CPU core and it's got a couple um, basic components. So the CPU core needs the program memory or instruction memory. So this is the memory that's holding on to the machine instructions that the CPU is going to execute. Mm -hmm. So when you write a higher level program in say C++, the compiler is going to take that, um, that program and compile it down into machine instructions. Mm -hmm. And those are what's depicted here. So. In, as far as the computer sees, these are just ones and zeros in memory. Mm -hmm. But we like to think about their actual meaning. So we think about these as, okay, this instruction, first instruction here is an or of an immediate value. And what's meant by immediate is that the value is in the instruction itself in the memory. Some of these bits over here are representing this zero value. Mm -hmm. And other bits are telling us this instruction is an OR. Mm -hmm. It's operating on this X6 register and this X0 register. So this is actually um, ORing a zero value with the value in register six, uh, register zero, and putting that result in register six. Mm -hmm. And we can see that execution by stepping forward. So we have a couple cycles where the machine is getting set up, and then on this cycle the machine is grabbing this instruction out of the instruction memory and figuring out what the instruction is. Mm -hmm. So based um, on the uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, it knows it's going to be this ORY instruction. Exactly. And so <clears throat> it says, okay, this is an OR immediate. So we're going to um, look at this register X0 and actually in this architecture, uh, register zero is just a hard-coded zero, zero value, so there's no actual register there. It's just going to always grab zero for x0. Mm -hmm. So it grabs a zero value in uh, from x0. It, uh, I'm wondering if I can make my cursor bigger, but hopefully oh, you can I, see it's where fine. I'm pointing. It's fine. Um, and an immediate zero from the instruction itself, as I said. 
and it's oring zero and zero, which obviously is producing zero. Mm -hmm. So when you or two values, the values are bit patterns. The or is just bitwise looking at each corresponding bit pair and saying, um, doing an or operation, which is going to uh, assert the resulting bit if either of the input bits is mm -hmm. non-zero. Okay, so I have, I have so a question. So I get a zero. So this mm -hmm. is just one bit operation, correct? This is actually, it's a bitwise operation, meaning it's doing an operation on every bit individually. Okay, so, but uh, um, and the, in ah, okay, case, I see there are, uh, the registers zeros. are integer. It means uh, what mm -hmm. they will be like, 8-bit registers or? So here, these are actually 32-bit values 32. being okay. loaded. Um, I think these are represented in hexadecimal, but we'll see later. It might be decimal. Over here, I know they're decimal. Okay. And what we're looking at in memory is hexadecimal. So, okay, what are those, the, what are the registers? Know. Yeah, so registers are just uh, storage locations for values that are close to the processor. Mm -hmm. So we can access these values quickly because it's a relatively small storage of values. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so then after we, you know, after we do some computation on these registers and we're done with that computation, but we want to remember it, we'll store that result in the data memory, mm -hmm. which is larger and more distant. Okay, so we basically we use registers because it's it's for example easier to use them in the instructions or access these registers in the instructions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know if you think about the instruction encoding itself, you've got this bit pattern telling you what to operate on. To access main memory, it, you main memory is large. You probably need sixty four bits of um, of value to access into memory. Mm -hmm. The register file is small. It's 32 entries. You need five bits to access into 32 values. But so uh, registers are also basically memory, correct? Uh, just very small memory. They are. It's just smaller and closer to the CPU. Okay. So what is C uh, so CSRS? Ah, so CSRs are stands for control and status registers. So these are also registers. They're special registers. And we're not going to focus too much on those. Um, here we have things like uh, the machine is keeping track of time for us. It's keeping track of cycle count. Um, but here we're not worried about those special purpose registers. Okay. I think there is also so like... Uh... What is it called? PC? Is the counter yeah the PC um, represented here by this hand? Okay. <laughs> so this is showing us the instruction that we're fetching. Okay. And so can we explain let me just what step PC through. means? Yeah, PC is program counter. So that's uh, it's also called um, instruction pointer. Same thing, IP or PC, and it's just pointing to the instruction that the, the CPU is going to execute. Mm -hmm. So the line before we, we talk, are executing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so before we talk about specifically the operation of every instruction, let me just give you an overview of the operation here by stepping through. Okay. And you'll see that this program counter over here is stepping one mm -hmm. instruction each time. It's fetching it to decode it, execute it, grabbing values from the registers. So just stepping through one by one, grabbing mm -hmm. instructions, decoding them, executing them. And you compose these instructions to do something meaningful. Um, here we're at an instruction called bran uh, a branch instruction. This is a branch less than, so it's doing a comparison of two register values. And if one is less than the other, it's going to branch. And we're using that to create a loop. So mm -hmm. if I step forward, we see that the program counter jumped back up here, which mm -hmm. is where the branch pointed us. And we're in a loop now. And if I just keep executing, we're stepping through that loop. And we just mm -hmm. keep going through that loop until we've completed it, and then we'll fall through the branch and execute these remaining instructions. What is LW? Oh, Sorry. LW yeah. is load word. So this is a load instruction. So that's that's uh, instruction which works with data memory. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a store here. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so let me explain what this program's doing. Okay. So we loaded up this core and checked the box over here that said, let me work with a custom instruction, a custom program. So oh. this is the program. OK, so this is the program which we uh, specified when we were creating the processor. Yeah, so this is really interesting. The um, So this environment is not 
only building us the CPU core hardware, it also kind of built in has a, what's called an assembler. So the assembler is responsible from, for taking these instructions that are human readable and turning them into the bit patterns. Mm -hmm. And so through the process of compiling this hardware model, we've actually assembled these instructions into their bit patterns that we see here and built a an instruction memory that's hard coded with these instructions. So that's actually um, what we've done through the compilation process. We are fleshing process. the firmware. Yeah, <laughs> essentially. Um, and there, there's no actual flashing going on. It's it's more like here we're we're building the hardware with the bits hard coded. We're actually building the the bits into the hardware yeah, model. The software, so, the, the firmware is actually like it's just built, built into from the, the gates, gates and essentially. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, this is not what we would realistically do if we're building a CPU. We would actually be building a path to uh, flash the the program, uh, you know, through some external uh, storage yeah, into the, you know. Um, so let's look at this program here. We have um, so this program is uh, computing the sum of numbers from one to nine. Mm -hmm. So this loop that we just walked through, each iteration of that loop is adding the next value to mm -hmm. our sum. So in the comments here, I'm showing how we've chosen to utilize the registers in the register file. So it looks like we're using registers one through six. Mm -hmm. And um, is, so register one is a running count. So each iteration of the loop is going to increment that. And you'll see register one here it looks like we're six iterations into the loop mm -hmm. you know if i just quickly run back here you'll see that that mm -hmm. register i'm stepping back in time so that's our our loop count register two is a hard-coded 10 value that got initialized and we see that yeah these are hexadecimal a. Mm -hmm. um you know uh, if you're not familiar with why hexadecimal, do we need a why do we need 10 value because we count up to 10 Exactly. So okay. that's going to tell us when to finish our loop. Mm -hmm. So that that branch uh, instruction that we looked at, which is comparing two mm -hmm. values, One it's comparing mm -hmm. okay, understand. the count with 10. Mm -hmm. So once the counts reach 10, we're going to fall through. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our output, which is our, our running sum. This is the result. And um, I'm not sure how we use temp. Um, and offset is the offset into memory. So you see here, Okay, step forward again. We're writing memory with this summation. So the first sum, which is just one, you know, the value one is one, one plus two is three, plus three is six, plus four is 10. Mm -hmm. So that's what our program is doing. And we can play around with this program. Um, we've got ourselves an environment where we can build both the program and the hardware. So let's say instead of doing a, a running sum, maybe I want to compute squares, let's say. So to compute squares, we have the same basic setup. We need a loop that's got a counter. Each iteration, we know which, count, which iteration we're on. But instead of adding to the previous count, we're, we're going, going to, to multiply. Yeah, we're going to, so we built our core to support multiply, and that instruction is called mul. So we're going to multiply the loop count by itself instead of by the previous count. Mm -hmm. And I'll go ahead and compile that. So this is going off to a server, doing the compilation, doing How a did you simulation. It? I didn't even know this. Where did you click? Oh, I'm sorry. I did a key keystroke. So I went up here and did compile sim. Okay. I actually hit control enter. Um, and so that's running a simulation. We can see the behavior of the simulation in a waveform like this. So this is showing us all the various wires, which we refer to as signals <laughs> in our model over time, right? So this is what is really happening inside of the processor. This is what's really happening in the guts of our processor at the signal level. Uh, the actual wires, the actual values that are bouncing around. And, but it's much easier to look at this uh, at a high level in this visualization. And 
So if I step forward here and we look at the values that are being computed in memory, they do indeed look like squares. So <clears throat> remember again, we're in hexadecimal, so yeah, every 16. digit is representing 16, so exactly 1016, four squared, and 19 is 25 in decimal. So it worked, <laughs> we're computing squares. Um, and uh, you know, again, the exciting thing about this is that you can do it yourself, right? This is not just me showing you what you can do, showing me what I can do. This is something you can do. So how do we create this from from the gates? <laughs> From, from the logic. Yeah, let's, so let's, now that we've seen, you know, the, what a CPU is all about, how it executes, let's step back now and do this ourselves. So let's step back to, you know, essentially zero, give ourselves a clean slate to work with. Um, so let me pull up some examples here. Um, MakerChip has a bunch of uh, tutorials, it's got some examples to learn from. It's got some courses. Um, we'll walk through today um, one of these courses and you can get a feel for how that course walks through the whole process of designing a CPU. If you're inspired by this, you know, you can go um, do this yourself at your own pace. Let's go over to our editor here and just play around with some very simple uh, logic to get a feel for things. Um, so just, you know, we don't need to worry too much about the template code here. Down here, we're, we're stopping the simulation after 40 cycles reporting passed. Mm -hmm. We can see that in our log just to get a quick um, view of the environment here. The, this is all the compilation. So this in blue is basically processing the TL Verilog and then uh, processing the Verilog and simulating the Verilog. So the TL Verilog becomes Verilog, uh, gets compiled and simulated, and we see passed after 40 cycles of simulation. Okay. Under the control of these statements. So we are going to start but with simple gate. Yeah, Sim simple let's gate. Let's do example. an inverter. Okay. So this so, is how we, uh, how we create inverter in when we like use programming language. Correct. Yeah. So this exclamation mark is a not. So we're saying I want an output value that's the inverse of the input value. And these are gonna be one bit values, either one or zero. And then compile. This is not processor, and this is just one single game. Not a processor <laughs> yet. We're, we got a little distance to go before we get to a processor. Um, so just putting up the waveform view and the logic diagram. Looking down here, I can see I have an input waveform and MakerChip was kind enough to give us random values on our input. And we have an output waveform that clearly is the inverse of the input. Mm -hmm. so and in electrical representation, this would be just uh, what? One gate. This is this is one logic gate okay. um, that is inverting the input signal to it's produce. Inverter. Yeah, okay. and just to be clear, in the waveform, you know, I think it's obvious, but time is left to right, so we're seeing the value on the input signal over time, and corresponding on the output. We're doing digital logic, so everything in here is ones and zeros, and uh, we have a clock, so all the logic is driven based on the control of a clock. So basically, you have um, logic, which mm -hmm. takes inputs and produces outputs, those outputs stabilize, and then the next clock edge comes along and says, okay, do the next computation. And we again take those values and through the combinational logic functions, produce new values and capture them, and then the next clock cycle. Mm -hmm. um, let's, uh, let's do another logic gate here. So let's do in one and in two. So I've done an AND gate. Mm -hmm. And I can see again that my output here asserts only when both inputs are asserted. You know, basically when this is implemented, this might be implemented in a, an ASIC uh, ultimately. And the ASIC is going to be built out of standard cells. Uh, so they're uh, standard, you know, the, the cell is basically 
a, a layout of silicon within some itsy bitsy ret rectangle, right? Mm -hmm. So they're pre-made um, logic cells for basic logic functions like not, and, et cetera. So and these we are look... the logic gates which are used to build the processor. That's right. So um, I can pull up an example here of some logic gates since we're talking about logic gates. So this is an example that I just loaded into my mm -hmm. editor. Uh, source code doesn't matter here. We're really looking at the uh, visualization. So let me put that down here. So we've got a circuit that's uh, just producing some inputs and driving those to various logic gates. And, I, and we visualize those logic gates here. Mm -hmm. So we can see the behavior here of various logic gates. And you know, when you're creating a digital circuit, we often represent that circuit as a schematic. Um, I had opened up just a Google search for some schematics. So here we see an example of a schematic that has a bunch of logic gates connected by wires. Um, the behavior of the various gates that we have here, um, and there are more complex gates, but these are some basic ones. And actually, interestingly, you can you can build an entire CPU core from just NAND gates. Really? So you can, yeah. <laughs> um, I think the same is true of NOR and maybe some other basic gates. But basically you can compose a NAND to build up these other logic functions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't actually design that way. They're more optimized implementations of the functions. But it's interesting just to think that from this very one simple logic gate, you can build an entire CPU core. Wow. Okay. In any so, case, yeah. well, just to illustrate the behavior here. So we see, well, let's start with a zero pattern. I guess I'm at the end of ah, simulation. Okay, you can do it this way. So we have a zero pattern on all the inputs, and we see that and or this is exclusive or, which is um, producing a, an assertion, asserted output when either but not both inputs are asserted. Mm hmm so let's look at these three first and see what happens when we change the input values. So these are not both one. One of these is one, so this asserts. And again, one but not both. Um, if I have both inputs asserted, it's the exclusive or is not true, whereas the others are true. And these three are simply inverted output from these three. And okay. that's represented in the symbol as a, a bubble on the output. So how do we create from this processor? I, you know, like you have right. just a bunch of something with three pins, for example, and suddenly you can execute mm -hmm. software. Right, right. So it's all by composition. So, you know, if we, we can chain these together, for example, by... Uh, taking the output and I don't know I'll, I'll put an inverter here so now I've created a NAND essentially and compile that and through composition we can create more interesting logic functions let's put an OR gate here with in three right so now I've got a uh, this is my AND combined with an OR. Mm -hmm. um, so in uh, RTL languages and transaction level Verilog, which is sort of a level above RTL, we support vectors. So we can do operations on vectors as well. Vector uh, means we do... uh, it's going to be Vector... not only one bit, but it's going to be more bits. Exactly. So. Let's do operations on a byte, seven bits. We can take an input that is also uh, eight bits, sorry. So this is basically same circuit, but eight times in parallel. Yeah, so this one, I'll do an adder. And then we zoom in. These are, again, in hexadecimal. So let's find some values here that are uh, easy to look at. So small values. I've got a lot of big values here. Um, okay, here are two sixes added together. So six plus six is 12, which in hexadecimal mm -hmm. is C. So this is like real addition. This is not like bit uh, or, or something like that. This is real addition to... It, 
Yes. Real two numbers are really like added right. together. Right. So this is giving you a slight abstraction. You know, add is a very well-known composition of logic gates. Uh, we can uh, just Google. Uh, these are built out of full adders, so we can uh, Google full adder and. This combination of logic gates implements one bit of addition, mm -hmm. and then the result of that one bit addition has a carry. That carry goes into the next addition. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, it would be a chain. cascade or something like that. Yes, exactly. Um, and there are you know various optimized circuit level implementations of that and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, when you also... created this one line, you actually use a bunch of right. gates which are connected together. Right, and it's up to a, a tool known as a logic synthesis tool to take this higher level description of your, your circuit behavior and implement the gates behind it and come okay. up with the circuit okay. level. I have a next question. So yeah. how do we go from addition to executing program? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so one of the key steps here, which we haven't talked about much, is the clock. All right, so all of this is controlled by a clock, so we have, um, circuit elements known as flip-flops um, that are going to hold on to a value from one cycle to the next. And let me just code up a, a simple flip-flop here. So we have an input that's driven by a random value and we have an output that is the previous value of the input. And don't worry too much about the syntax here, but you can read this as previous. Okay. So here we can see that indeed the output is the previous value of the input. After so one clock. After one clock. So, you know, this value here gets captured on the uh, and on the clock edge allowed to propagate to the output. Mm -hmm. So we've got this input signal. This square here is a flip flop. Uh, specifically, it's a D flip flop, which just takes the input to the output. Uh, connected up to the output. So it is like and, uh, one memory cell? Yeah. So the flip-flop is the gatekeeper saying, oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, clock edge, you can go forward. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I had pulled this up uh, logic level. So here's, uh, again, a Google search of a D flip-flop. So you see that you can implement these using logic gates. And the key here that introduces time is that you've got um, First of all, this feedback path here that's stabilizing the value in the circuit, and you've got a clock input that is used to allow the D input value to propagate through. So not talking about the specifics of you know, these gate functions, but the basics here is that you've got the clock that's preventing the value D from propagating forward until the clock pulses. Mm -hmm. And that's able to uh, you know, hold on to the value until that clock edge and give us this behavior that allows us to take values from one clock cycle and use them in the next cycle. Why do we need this? So this is needed because um, it, essentially to give us the behavior that we saw in that CPU simulation where uh, first, so in the CPU that we were looking at, we were computing an entire execution of one instruction each clock cycle. Okay. So we would get the instruction from the instruction memory through combinational logic, which is all built out of logic gates. We would figure out what that instruction was and decide what to uh, operate on from the register file and write back to memory or write back to the register file or memory. We did all that in a cycle, and then the next cycle, we do the next instruction. So every cycle, the machine is doing the same operation on different data, mm -hmm. right? So in the case of a CPU core, it's doing the same operation on an instruction. Every cycle, we fetch a different instruction, do similar computation, um, and then based on the results of that computation, we do the next computation. So in the CPU, the the flip-flops are basically the register file. That's mm -hmm. where we're holding on to the result of our computation that cycle and the memory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need these flip-flops to create the register files, which we then use when we are executing the uh, instruction. Precisely, yeah. Okay, and uh, execute, executing in 
instruction is basically using, for example, this plus or end or something, or it depends basically what we are doing, what kind of instruction yeah, we are executing. Right, let's get into that. Um, so let's see how we, using uh, TL Verilog, describe this circuit behavior so that we can execute instructions in a CPU core. So we're gonna march through this, uh, this course. And again, I've got various versions of courses that are all talking about CPU uh, core. So it depends how much detail you wanna get into. Uh, we're gonna do something very simple. We're not gonna build the whole CPU core uh, we're going to build enough of a CPU core to execute that test program that we were just looking okay. at, which is I'm summing curious. numbers. I'm, I'm curious how we are going to build it from from the logic. <laughs> so I'm going to load up the starting code, and uh, I'll hold on to, I don't need the videos really, but I'll hold on to the slides down here for reference. I've loaded up the starting template, and this is giving us some of the logic for the CPU core. Actually, just looking down here, basically, this is what we're going to build. It's similar to the picture that we looked at um, previously. So the CPU core is built out of uh, these components. Let me walk through them uh, very quickly. Okay. So you've got your program counter logic, which is figuring out the, the instruction that we want to execute. So that's basically okay. uh, the line where we are here. Yeah. yeah and... Normally, normally it is just incrementing by one unless you are skipping through, or unless you are using like instructions which will skip skip to different place. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So branch instructions or there's also jump instructions. <clears throat> so most of the time. PC gets PC plus one mm -hmm. every cycle, every clock. Mm -hmm. And this little thing down here is representing a flip-flop. So mm -hmm. that's for remembering the previous program counter, adding one to it. Mm -hmm. So it's that simple. Okay, so we are on the first line, the second line, the third line. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we take that program counter and that becomes our index into the instruction memory to grab mm -hmm. our instruction give that instruction to the decode logic of the processor mm -hmm. that's responsible for figuring out what is this instruction? What am I supposed to be doing with okay. it? What registers do I need to access? And then it accesses the register values and those values are sent into the arithmetic logic unit, which is responsible for the actual execution of the instruction. So it's presented with the source values and it produces a value and that value is written back to the register file. When it's arithmetic logical logic unit, it means uh, there are only the mathematical instructions or it includes all the kind of instructions? It includes other instructions, bit manipulation instructions, so left and right shift operators that are shifting bits or bitwise and and or operators. And um, memory operations. So memory operations that might involve the arithmetic logic unit to compute the address that's used for the memory operation, for example. But uh, the actual, the arithmetic logic unit, what's fundamental about it is that it's taking generally two values from the register file mm -hmm. and okay. producing so a value. So it's working with register, not with data right memory. Right back to the register file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's this would be considered a load store architecture, okay. meaning you've got special instructions for doing loads and stores that interface with memory everything else is operating out of the arithmetic logic unit okay and but that would file. make our processor much more complicated i guess mm -hmm. yeah and here our program uh, this program that we're basically implementing our subset processor for doesn't do any loads and stores it's okay. executing purely out of the register file just to keep things simple okay so here on the right side we can see basically uh, there are the registers, what, mm -hmm. we, what we are going to use, or maybe what we, yeah. Yeah, this is similar to the visualization that we saw for Warp mm -hmm. 5. It's just a little simpler, only because this course was put together before that visualization was created. Uh, but same thing, uh, you've got the register file, the decode logic and execution okay. and program memory. Okay. And this logic that we're starting with gives us the pieces that are in blue here. So okay. it's giving us a program counter that increments by one. Okay, so we don't have to program this. Not the plus one part, but okay. we will program the branch part. Okay. 
uh, it's giving us an instruction memory and a register file. Instruction and we're memory, code it means that's the hard-coded software? It's giving us, yes, the hard-coded software, okay. right? Um, and so if we execute what we have currently, you see the program counter keeps fetching. The instructions aren't actually doing anything mm -hmm. or they're doing random things with the register file. Mm -hmm. And we get to this branch instruction, we're just going to the next instruction because we haven't implemented the logic to decode that it's a branch okay. or figure so out which registers to access. How do we decode the... So I'm just going to walk through basically mm -hmm. uh, bit by bit these different pieces. So let's look at uh, the program counter. Um, we're not going to code it, but just to understand what's in it. Uh, so and. You know, there's a lot of syntax represented here. Don't worry too much about the syntax. We'll see the syntax as we go. But just to read what this means, if we're in reset, set the program counter to zero. Mm -hmm. That starts us off okay. with the first instruction. Otherwise, if we're a taken branch, then go to the branch target. So this logic is in the PC. We're not yet assigning the branch target or the uh, branch the taken branch or the branch target. And the default case, <clears throat> uh, previous value of the PC plus, this is essentially plus one. So okay. just deciphering the syntax here. This is a 32-bit binary 100, which is four. And the way this microarchitecture works, the program counter is a byte address and instructions are 32 bits. So instruction addresses are multiples of four. So then plus one is basically a plus four bytes. So that's uh, our, our, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I understand because uh, if we would be counting by one, then we would kind of uh, jump into half of the command or half of the instruction, mm -hmm. but we would like to actually jump to the next instruction. So we need to actually jump not one address more, but four addresses because one instruction uh, is built from four addresses. Right, right. Uh, and that alignment and, and the never branch, changes. And the branch target PC, that's uh, uh, a register or? This we're gonna get, we're gonna assign this later. Uh, right now it's just a placeholder, so it's probably stuck at zero. Okay. Um, but this will be, you know, you can again read this as, if the previous instruction was a taken branch instruction, then this PC should get the target of that taken branch. Yeah, okay. And we'll have to f fill in what these two are. OK. Um, and then we have some logic that's connecting us to our instruction memory. So we have instruction memory also. We're not going to look at that logic. Um, this is just connecting up, saying our address for the instruction memory is the PC. And here, this instruction memory is taking a word address, not a byte address. So mm -hmm. here we're hooking up bit, the lower bits. We're not including bits one and zero. So basically so this is assigning uh, the instruction, or this is taking the instruction from the, uh, from the uh, hard-coded code based on PC number. The instruction yes. 31 to zero, that will be the current instruction what we are going to process. Right, so we feed in the PC as our address, we get that instruction, the instruction comes out of the memory as a memory data. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, that's our instruction. So we're just renaming it, to say, okay. call it instruction, yeah, call it what it is. That. Okay, perfect. So now we'll get to our first bit of the lab So exercise. the instruction is how many bits? Go go a little bit The up. instruction's 32 bits, yep. Uh, uh, yep. But I mean the, Mm, command itself, the et, for example. Not whole instruction, because part of the instructions are the uh, register references. Oh, oh sure. Um, so I think I had this open. Yeah, there we go. Um, that's not the right thing. Actually, I have this down here in the slides as well. So let's look at what's actually in the instruction. Uh, so this table is showing us the makeup of the instruction. So these would be the 32 bits that are coming out of the mm -hmm. instruction memory, the instruction bits. 
So the instruction is made up of an opcode, which tells you, um, generally this is telling you what the instruction is, although it might not be the full breakdown, um, but it would certainly tell you this is a, a probably an add instruction or mm -hmm. a, Okay, and you uh, only need two bits? Is, is it enough? Six, this is, this is seven bits. Oh yeah, okay, okay, I understand, I'm sorry. Um, actually, the lower two aren't used for the most part. Um, but anyway, so basically it's a five bit uh, opcode. So, and based on this code, uh, we will recognize yes. if it's ad or if it's uh, BLT or if it's something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and part of what the opcode, some of the opcode bits here are gonna break down the instruction based on the format of the instruction. So we're looking at different instruction types here. You've got R type, which operates on two source registers. You've got I type for immediate type, which operates on a source register mm -hmm. and some immediate bits in the instruction. This opcode, is, um, is there a standard or something? Yeah, so this is, uh, we're using the RISC-V instruction set. And, you know, you, you very likely have heard about RISC-V. It's got a lot of buzz. And basically the buzz is, is the fact that it's an open standard. So in the past, most instruction set architectures have, ha have been proprietary. Um, and that's been an obstacle for academia to explore, you know, CPU design in the context of those Everyone instruction Everyone basically sets. had to design these instructions by themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we have an open standard that's, uh, you know, free of entanglements. Okay. And that's very exciting for the, the ecosystem. It, can, can we search for this kind of document? I'm just curious. What, so if uh, someone would like to build based on this, yeah, the so riskv.org is the site for all things risk five, um, and you know there's lots of good things here. Actually, uh, let me see. I think they've restructured things a little bit, but we should have. Uh, yeah, they've changed things around, so I'm not sure how to navigate. But oh, here it is, cores. I was just going to show that the warp five core that we just looked at is one of the cores that you can find in the risk five exchange. And they've got, you know, it's such a popular instruction set architecture that there are probably hundreds or at least over a hundred different cores that folks have submitted that implement risk five. Okay. Okay. So if someone would like to know exactly uh, specification of these instructions, they can find it here. Yeah, the specification is under technical specifications and uh, the unprivileged specification is the starting point. Um, and then supporting operating systems and so on, you need the privileged instructions as well. But this would be your starting point. Okay. Um, so yeah, so you have, based on the opcode, different instruction types. This is the format for branch type. Um, it looks similar to uh, kind of a combination of the other two, I guess. It's got two source registers and the immediate bits are specifying the offset for your, your branch. So if you need to branch eight instructions backwards like our loop is doing, this immediate field would be negative eight. Okay, and we will use this table to decode the in instruction. That's right, yep. Yeah, and I've set this up to be, you know, as simple as possible, just so you can get a taste. The test program that we're executing, you can see it's only using three different instructions. Mm -hmm. So really, all we need to implement for our CPU core is add, add immediate, and branch, mm -hmm. if less than. So first step here is decoding the instruction type. So it's exactly what we were just talking about. You get the opcode, and based on the opcode, you need to know which of these formats your instruction is so in. So these are the bits of five and six? Bits five and six. So uh, where's my table? Here, I have a table that's telling me exactly that breakdown. So we have uh, the instruction bits two to six, as mm -hmm. we mentioned, are the opcode bits. And based on uh, on those bits, we have different instruction formats. Mm -hmm. So since we only need to worry about I type, R type, and B type, <clears throat> we can simplify the decode a little bit. The I type is always cases where bits six and five are zero. Mm -hmm. So bits six and five are zero, mm -hmm. and we have an I type instruction. So I'll just go ahead and fill in. And again, 
you know, I, I encourage you to do this, um, you know, as I'm doing it or after following the course and so on. But, uh, you know, we have our type, which if we look in our table, zero we one can decode that exactly. So zero, one, four, and let's just copy this. One, zero. And then similarly for B type. And if, if we have a, if we think about this code, like uh, in terms of mm -hmm. logic, in terms of gates, physical gates, then this would be like making connections between different ends and odds and, and the result will be, this is the instruction, correct? Right, right. Yeah, and again, that's up to logic synthesis tools. We don't generally, you know, as logic designers work at that level, mm -hmm. tools are very good at optimizing our logic from RTL. Mm -hmm. So I've compiled this, um, and actually, I don't think we're going to see anything noticeably different in the behavior yet. Because so we still need to on. specify this specific instruction, correct? Yeah, we figured out the, the type, but we haven't really done anything with it that will visibly change the behavior. So um, actually, I'm going to skip the immediate code and get back to that immediate decode and decode the instructions. I think it's more natural to do that first. So this gets us to this picture again, where we have our instruction formats. Mm -hmm. And um, the so one of the, the world has come to realize that simpler is better when it comes to CPU design. And that's what risk processors are all about, reduced instruction set computing. So keep the, the number of instructions to a minimum, keep the formats of the instructions to a minimum. If you look at uh, CISC, which is the counterpart to RISC, complex instruction set computing like x86, you have many more instruction types. The instructions are variable width, so, um, you know, really? in RISC <laughs> yeah. That makes it more complicated to decode the instructions. It does, than... exactly. And uh, so we've, we've come to like simple. <laughs> so all of our instructions here are 32 bits wide. Um, and so, and if you look at the fields, you know, the big difference is that the register, the source register two, for example, is always coming from the same place in the mm -hmm, instruction. Mm -hmm. And so the decode logic is to get to the register file is, is nothing. You just hook up the instruction bits coming straight out of the instruction memory directly into the register file and say, mm -hmm. this is the index to the register that I want for this instruction. Um, so, so is it, it keeps... also helping with speed? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because the, the path is shorter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to go through so many gates, for right. example. Right, exactly. So I've started this by hooking up the RS2 field that we were just talking about. So RS2 always comes from bits 42 down to 20. Mm -hmm. And we can hook up the others here. So. Uh, RS1, thank you. And Funk 3. 14 12. Is 14 to 12. And 11 to 7, it looks like. Okay. I'm curious if it's going to work. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually good if I make a mistake because then you get to see how do you deal with mistakes and debug your design. Um, that's where you spend most of your time, right? But let's compile this. And uh, let's but see. But it still did. will be doing basically nothing. It only recognizes the, the type. Oh, it can also right. it can also decode. Uh, we no, might it... see that we're now grabbing registers. Uh, I'm not sure, but I did compile, and you know, as promised, there is a bug. So we look in our log. Uh, the TL Verilog was processed Expecting without any errors. Column or semicolon. And yep, and that's actually from the previous line. So <clears throat> you know, for as you're using this platform. It's good to remember, I actually, see, I'll, I'll pull up the, this help yeah. here. Um, 
what's happening behind the scenes so that you can understand the messages that you get. So you're editing, sorry, you're editing your code that's getting sent to the cloud. It's getting run through the tools that process the TL Verilog and turn them into Verilog or System Verilog .sv. So there's some pre-processing done, and then Sandpiper is the Redwood EDA tool that uh, produces the System Verilog from the TL Verilog, and then that sends back to your browser the uh, these pieces. We didn't look at this one, but. Um, and after you have your Verilog, you send that through a tool called Verilator, which is an open source Verilog uh, compiler and simulator. Verilator produces a C++ simulator, and that C++... C++ and there is G. <laughs> uh, G. Well, G++ being the uh, GNU C++ compiler. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, so... Um, so that C++ simulator run through GNU C++ is um, is simulated, producing a waveform, which gets sent back to the browser. And all of this gets collected in the log. So you're seeing log messages from all of these steps, mm -hmm. these being in blue, these being in black. And so what we're seeing is down here. So we're seeing errors processing the Verilog. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice in the log that the error message doesn't quite look like our source code. <clears throat> That's because it's been pre-processed um, by Sandpiper from the, Ver the TL Verilog. Mm -hmm. But we can recognize fairly straightforward that we're assigning op code to instruction. Yeah, I've seen where, where semicolon is missing. So we go back to our editor. We see this is the line that's reported. The semicolon is missing from the line before. And we compile again. So let's see if our behavior is any different yet. We're going to step through, and I think what I would expect to maybe see is that we're starting to access the mm -hmm. register file. And we do, there's R10. We're correctly identifying R10 mm -hmm. from the instruction. So yeah, okay. R13. So our CPU is getting a little bit better, that's good. And now I'm going to jump back to the immediate decode. So you see here, some of these instruction formats have immediate bits. <clears throat> so this is the uh, fixed, uh, this is the value which we can directly uh, write in the code. Correct. Yep. So this would be, you know, the add immediate instruction <clears throat> over here as uh, R13 as a source register and a value of one. So this one is the immediate mm -hmm. field. For a branch instruction. So R13 plus one. Right. For the branch instruction down here, this is the immediate value. This is the branch target offset. So, that's so this the is actually- Address where it should jump. Correct. And this mm -hmm. is actually a negative value. So this is saying jump backwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so here we're seeing the immediates uh, grayed out because in this step we're uh, decoding the other fields. Um, but this table here is telling us how to form the immediate out of those immediate fields. So for an I-type instruction, for example, we form the immediate by extending bit 31 of the instruction uh, to, I think this is 20 bits or 20 one bits and uh <clears throat> and then if you look at these fields broken down this is actually all one contiguous field bit 30 down to 25 24 to 21 20 so this is just 30 down to 20. and so if we uh compare that with the breakdown of the instruction itself again 30 down to well it's 31 down to bit 20. if we look at the i type <clears throat> we see that the immediate is here in bit 31 down to 20. Mm -hmm. So this is saying we take these bits and form a 32-bit immediate value out of it by taking those bits from the instruction and sign extending or replicating bit 31. But what does it and, mean then you can't have number higher than 20 bits? Correct. So this would be for an add-i instruction, for example. Um, and 
Yeah, because of the way the instruction is packed, you only have 20 bits available, uh, 21 bits available as that source for your add. So if you did need to do an add of a constant value that was larger than 20 bits, you would use other instructions to to load immediate bits into all 31 bits of a register and then do an add instruction using that register. So why do you write here the other instructions into bits 0 to 10 if we, if we don't really use it because there will be the code of the instruction, no? So here we have the, just to go over it one more time, I think this will help. So this is the immediate instruction with yeah, the immediate I understand bits. This. Okay. But I don't understand why they fit here the, or why they describe these other bits here, because they are already used by the code and, and the other stuff. Ah, so, yeah, so what we're looking at here is not the instruction. What we're looking at here is the immediate value that we're uh, creating from the instruction. So if you look at the machinery that, you know, after we decode this instruction and get the immediate value, we execute it. But that's we can't influence done. the low bits because they are based on the instruction. Yeah, that's right. But the they're all going to be fed to the arithmetic logic. OK, unit OK, I understand. OK, so we need yeah. to mask them or something. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the machinery of the CPU is built to operate on 32 bit values. So this is taking the 21 bits from the instruction. Oh, oh I understand and now. I understand now. Mapping them into a 32 mm -hmm. bit value that it can then execute. So, so theoretically, theoretically, they will be transferred, but we would like to not use them because we can't really mm -hmm. control what is inside of yeah them. we have to drive something to the arithmetic logic unit mm -hmm. okay and i understand now so we're just going to take that upper 31 bit and that's what we're driving to the arithmetic logic unit for this instruction mm -hmm. so here's where we're forming that um the immediate value and so the 32 bit immediate um we're going to form this for all instruction types that's mm -hmm. sort of the way the instruction set architecture is mm -hmm. specified. Okay. Based on the instruction type, we're going to grab different bits. So um, I didn't explain this syntax here. This is uh, similar to C or JavaScript it uses the same uh, syntax. This is a ternary operator that says if, if this condition is true, so if this is an I-type instruction, mm -hmm. then this value. Otherwise this value and you can chain them together then to um, you know just like we did with the program counter to say if it's reset then this otherwise this otherwise mm -hmm. uh, PC plus one so same thing here so let's fill this in for B type if we have a B type instruction and this is a really strange syntax from Verilog for replication uh, well, both replication and concatenation of bits. So in, uh, we should look at this one first. Yeah, no, so I'm just thinking, a, what does it mean? <laughs> it's, it's a mess of these open braces and closed braces. So there's actually two different operators here, which makes it confusing. This, oper this is a replication. So this is expanding the 31, bit 31 to 21 copies. So this is a vector of 21 copies of instruction bit 31. And then the the, square, the uh, brace with commas is concatenation of bits. So this is a concatenation of 21 replicas of bit 31 and bits 30 down to zero the, to 20. And that matches up with replicate bit 31, concatenate bit 30 down to 20. We're forming this vector. So we're, we're taking bits 30 down to 20 of the instruction and placing them into bits 0 to 10. And so now for the B type, we can do the same kind of thing. We need to replicate bit 31. I think this would be, if I got that right, 20 bits now of instruction 31. And concatenate that with bit seven. And 
And you can read my eyes for typos. Instruction. Uh, what's next? 30 to 25. I'm not quite sure why in the table they actually break these down when they're contiguous, but um, what do we have? 11 to 8. And, and then a 1 bit 0. So in, um, in Verilog, that's, sorry, a 1 bit binary 0 value. Okay, so that should be our expression. Okay. Let's compile and see if I actually did that right. So you just manipulated the bits in the correct order into the 31 bit. Well, no, I attempted to anyway, but there is an error here. <laughs> uh, okay, inst, that was just a typo. Should be inster. And... Where do I have? Oh, I am missing the semicolon or the colon. All right, so this should give us the immediate field for B type. So let's get to our branch. And we do have an immediate value here. This is in decimal and it's negative. It's represented as a positive number. So who knows okay. if this is right, but presumably we now get a value there for the immediate. So that's good. And then the next step. So we should our... see the uh, value also in on the third instruction, correct? That's also the immediate. Yeah. And I think that was already there because that was in the placeholder code. But that does have a 10. And we see the 10 here. OK. And you can dig through all this in the waveform as well. Um, it's just hard to look at. <laughs> so um, in addition to, this is something we haven't really shown, um, but this will be neat to look at in the waveform. Uh, we're going to determine when these different fields that we've pulled out are actually valid. So if we look back at this decode table, not every instruction type actually needs these fields. Mm -hmm. The RS1 value, for example, the source register one exists for all three of the types that we care about. Mm -hmm. The RS2, let's look at that one. We need that for R type and B type, but not for I type. So just copy this expression to both of these. And we don't have a valid source two for I type. And then RD is not valid for B type. So let's get rid of B type here. So now we have three signals that are telling us when the fields are valid. And I think this is already hooked up. Yeah, it is. So if we look down here, these signals are already hooked up for us to the register file. So the register file is going to take in two addresses mm -hmm. for the registers that we're going to access. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take in two va corresponding valid bits saying, um, and basically this is for power savings. OK, so this um, is decoding don't... what register exactly it is. Well, okay. we already decoded the registers when we pulled out the RS1, RS2 field. This is, are they valid? And ah, if they're okay. not valid, the register file won't bother to do a lookup. It'll ah, save okay, a okay, power. Understand, okay, understand. Um, and when I run, when I compile that, we should now see something interesting in the waveform about TL Verilog that's unique from Verilog. Um, I'm not seeing that, so I wonder if we're actually using them. Um, well, I guess never mind. <laughs> um, I was expecting that we would see that. Um, many of the fields that we're using. Um, and I, I guess we really don't use these very much is why we're not seeing anything. But if there's logic um, based on whether, you know, if this register is valid or not, we're going to do some function, uh, you would see in the waveform that 
we're not actually doing anything for this particular instruction because it's not valid. Um, I think, I apologize that I couldn't illustrate that. I think we're just not actually driving any logic other than the actual register file with these valids. In any case, um, we should now, um, I think, see. So we are almost finished. I see. Do we, we, do we just need to say if it's at? Yeah, we're really getting close. I mean, it's it's amazing how quickly um, when you know what you're doing, you can build a CPU. When you have half of the software all, already written. Already written, <laughs> sure. But, you know, now that once you go through this one time and have context for it, you could very easily go back and code the whole thing. Um, this is really just to give you a starting point for syntax and the frame of reference. So next part is, um, oh, I guess we haven't done instruction decode yet. Uh, let me go to this picture. So these are the parts that we're going through and implementing. Um, yeah, so we've decoded, um, I thought we already, okay, I guess we didn't actually. Um, we've decoded the type of the instruction, we've pulled apart the fields. Now we need to know what operation we're actually going to yeah. do in the arithmetic logic yeah. unit. So we'll fill in these two, and we've got a table. Uh, here from the RISC-V instruction set manual. Mm -hmm. So if you actually go here and open up the specification, you'll uh, open up this link. You'll find this table. And the three instructions that we care about for our core are mm -hmm. these. And this is showing us the two fields that are decoding the instruction. So we talked already about the fact that the opcode tells us what instruction we have. For some instructions, um, including most of the arithmetic instructions and actually branches too, we have additional bits that help mm -hmm. us break down the, the actual instruction. These are the function three bits that we already pulled out. Mm -hmm. So for branch, um, well, let's do add i first. So for add i, this zero, is the zero, bit zero. pattern that we care about. So let me just copy this 10 bit binary value of 001, 0011. And. No, first should be 000. zero, zero. Ah, okay. You yeah, are right. Oh, okay. Yes. Nope, that's a good correction. And then add i. Uh, we've got. Oh, sorry, this is add. Uh, so I did branch already, zero, 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 one, one, zero, zero, one, one okay. from here. And we compile that and now we should have um, add decoded. So before we did not have add i decoded, we do have the operation for add i. We should now be seeing add i execute correctly and we do add 0 and 10 now and get 10, which I'm guessing before we did not. And let's see, we have the ALU left and the branch target, and then we will actually be done for our CPU core. So now that we know if we have an add instruction, we can execute it and add, should add the source value from the register and the source value from the other register. And it's as simple as that. We just like that, we're done our simple ALU. So now we should see add instructions. Zero plus zero, zero. More zeros. Uh, zero plus one is one, looks good. Branch, we're not gonna branch back, so. We're not adding anything interesting so yet. Again, it is R10, R0, R0. It means, uh, what does it mean? Which one is which one? Oh, yeah, I, I don't like that about the uh, assembler syntax, but the <laughs> it's not consistent even. The, if there is a destination register, it's first. Okay, so, so the result will be is, in the first one? Yeah. Okay, and then... But uh, then it's confusing because branch doesn't have a target, a destination register, so these okay. are two sources. But so anyway, let, that's the way let's it's... go on the first, uh, first one. So it's going to be... Uh, 
Which one, the ad? First one, yeah, first ad. So you say that's a zero plus zero, and it's it goes to ten. To register t ten. Okay. Yeah. The next and one. I'm, I'm is... showing these here as R's, and in, in uh, risk, uh, risk five actually defines these as X uh, for the syntax. But either way. Okay. So and this one is zero plus ten. Uh, or register value of in regi register zero plus value in register 10 and goes to register 14 correct yep yep okay so we're doing a lot of adds of zero uh, this is the immediate with 10 which does produce a 10 and more zeros more zeros and the immediate of one so once we get the branch in there then we'll start adding some interesting values okay. Um, I think the way this one was set up was slightly different than the one in the Warp 5 example. This one actually starts by adding zero instead of starting with adding one. Anyway, um, so I think we're up to the branch logic. So we just need to compute whether we take the branch and then compute the branch target. So we're taking the branch if we have a branch instruction and the branch condition, the less than, is true. So, <clears throat> um, so this expression will be. I have is, no idea. Take and we only have to worry about branch less than. So I just wanted to make sure I had my signal name correct. Is BLT. So if this is a branch less than, and the comparison is true, the comparison for reference down here is this the source one register value is less than the source two register value. So it should be that simple. And we haven't yet defined the target of our branch, but let's just see what happens. So we branched to zero, it looks like, since our target is getting a default zero value. So our branch target now is computed based well, on Why the did we create it in the previous line? I, I don't know what is it doing. Which, why did we create which? Taken branch, the previous line. Oh, so this is controlling our program counter. If we go back up to program counter, right? If we have a taken branch ah, instruction. Okay, so it is just uh, true or false. Yeah. It, it's yeah. saying like, uh, this is the branch instruction. It's the branch instruction. So and we are is, going to. We are supposed to take it. Yeah, take we are going branch. to uh, take the PC and uh, do, what is it like, plus of the, <laughs> because it's negative. Yeah, and we're, we're actually going to do this. Um, in our branch target calculation. Okay, so this okay, is going okay, to be okay. program counter plus offset. Okay. And because it's so negative we'll value, now. it will actually decrease the yeah. program counter. Yeah, that's right. So we're computing the branch target, which is the PC plus the immediate. And this is a signed immediate, so it's a plus or a minus. Um, so branch target PC Oh, sorry. Uh, that's already here and named a little bit differently for no apparent reason. But program counter mm -hmm. plus the immediate value, which gives us our offset. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, binary signed values sort of magically work, whether you treat them as signed or unsigned. We're interpreting them as unsigned here for the. Um, the PC offset. Basically, when you're adding them in a an unsigned sense, the signed number or the if you have a number like we have here, which is uh, minus four instructions or something like that, this value here, the string of ones zero zero, that's a minus four in binary. If you interpret that as a signed number, it's a huge value, <laughs> and it wraps around in this. Uh, binary space to get you to this minus four. So it just sort of magically works to ignore the fact that this is science. Yeah, I know. Computation. I learned this at the university that it actually works. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, so this should work. I think it's that's all it is, just PC plus the immediate. So let's see. Branch. And we did branch. I was expecting it to be one instruction less, but um, let's see if that's our proper target. Uh, here's our loop, just these two add instructions. So that is indeed the top of our loop, and we seem to be doing the right thing. So let's step forward and see if we're actually incrementing correctly. And we're using different registers than we did with the warp five, but they're doing the same thing. So one of these is the running sum. That's probably the six. And then one of these is the count, which is probably this R13, the three here. So we should see as we continue to loop that this running count keeps incrementing. And so we've gone from, step back here, um, counting up to four, we have our bowling pins. We have 10 bowling pins. This is fascinating. You're just executing software in in the code what we just created <laughs> and you and all from your browser wow so plus five giving us uh how many pool balls in a pool rack seems to be working great so there we are it's all done this is cool so yeah um you know if you want to do more detail so we did a, a cpu that's a, running in a single cycle so every cycle we're fetching instruction, we're decoding, we're uh, grabbing values from the register file, we're executing the instruction, writing back to the register file. In reality, that's a really tall order for one cycle. That's, so that's, you might do that something. That would be really slow, correct? <laughs> it would. And, you know, it's not unrealistic for something like a microcontroller in a, uh, I don't know, a, a little edge sensor or something like that. Um, you run at a slow clock and doing it all in a cycle might be perfectly fine. But if you're talking about a general purpose computer running, you know, in a, like a, a running on your desktop or whatnot, those generally, um, and that's what I spent most of my career working on, a processor like that takes about maybe 20 cycles to fetch the instruction and execute it and write back the register file. Um, so you'll design a pipeline CPU core. And, uh, you know, if you want to go the next level and learn about that, this is actually, this is the magic to how we can actually teach pipeline CPU core design within a week is TL Verilog is much, much, much better at um, enabling pipeline design than Verilog. Um, so if you want to go into more detail, you can take one of these um, more complete courses. Um, I think we're running another myth workshop. So the, the first three here are free. They're online. Just jump in and do. Mm -hmm. um, this one comes with uh, live instruction and mentorship and so on. Um, so there is a, a cost, but it's very minimal. Um, and I think we have another one coming up soon. Um, so if someone is, is interested to, uh, to learn more about yeah i mean this one in particular is kind of a it's fairly not expensive week long it's very 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 inexpensive this is with some uh um some help from i i, I hope we can actually get this otherwise we're committed to a um, a low price but we've got some sponsorship uh, previously from the open source fpga foundation that mm -hmm. is now merging in with the asic alliance and these are organizations that promote open source hardware mm -hmm. so basically um, everything what we were talking about today you can then upload to fpga or, or you what can, can you yeah, do with this have... code what we just created yeah uh actually let me this is kind of fun um let me just go to some an example that I put together fairly recently that's not yet in MakerChip. Um, so this is opening up a design that is built in a way that you can actually uh, compile this for an FPGA and run it on an FPGA. Basically, you just download the code that you produce from here. Um, and uh, there's a, a Git repository um, for this um, virtual FPGA environment uh, with the tool flow all based on um, accessible 
well, it, it's Xilinx based, so the Xilinx mm -hmm. software is proprietary software, but Xilinx does have a free download for FPGA use. So if you have any of the supported um, boards, you can download your design. So here, the design that I've loaded is actually just pulling a bunch of different examples together that I have and sticking them on an FPGA. And this environment running within Makerchip is using the visualization feature of Makerchip to create this virtual FPGA environment. So you can see the impact that your code running on the FPGA would have on the FPGA board. You see the LEDs are doing a binary um, counting. So, so you can actually bits. write your FPGA code even without the board and you can see what it will be doing if you have the board. Exactly, yeah. And how can you yeah. upload this code or, or you compile it here and you get the hex file or something and then you, you use the standard Xilinx software yeah, to upload so there's, it? Uh, let's see, virtual FPGA lab. So this is again hosted by the Open Source FPGA Foundation. But this lab gives you the uh, scripts that you would need to take code that you develop in Makerchip. You can um, export the code by opening up the results and downloading your source code. Mm -hmm. Either the TL Verilog or the System Verilog, but um, this is set up scripts that will work with your TL Verilog as well. So you can, if you have a Xilinx FPGA with the Xilinx tools locally on your machine, you can, you can actually open up Makerchip in a way that um, it's editing the code that you have locally. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do this download. Uh, this is called Makerchip App. Makerchip App. So this is a, a tiny little shell Python that lets you run from your desktop, open up in your web browser your code, and uh, basically like you have a desktop editor for your source code. So you can use that as well instead of directly jumping to the browser. But the code that you're editing here directly will compile and run on your FPGA board. You can do like control C, control V. Uh, you can do that too. Yeah. Wow. But you, this code is in your special language, no? Or this one is not? Yeah. So what the scripts actually do, if you're. Oh yeah. Okay. Learning... I remember. So uh, this, your special code is translated to standard Verilog and this standard mm -hmm. Verilog then can be uh, right, right. Okay, compiled. Yeah, and it's kind of cool. You don't even have to download um, my tools in order to do that. I have a, a cloud microservice that compiles your code. And so if you use the scripts in this environment, this only is built for, um, for Linux, by the way. Um, we don't have the automation for Windows, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. But if you have the, you know, if you have all this locally and run the scripts, they will call, that they will send your TL Verilog code to the cloud and return your system Verilog. Mm -hmm. So this is made for open source development. Nice. Um, yeah, so this is all possible. This example is kind of, as I said, pulling together different examples that I have. So you can see um, how the components that, um, that you build using TL Verilog that come with visualization are composable. You can plug them together. So this is showing all the code which you actually upload into the FPGA chip. So there is the mm -hmm. microprocessor there. There are the gates. I don't know what is the other one. Yeah. <laughs> so here we have War 5 running in this FPGA. Mm -hmm. um, we have a fun little frog maze that I made with my kids. We have a genome uh, sequencer. Um, you know, all just sort of slapped together, but built in a way that you can run them on the FPGA. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, very exciting. All this stuff is evolving. Um, you know, the examples are, are going from basic, basic things uh, to CPU cores to, you know, complex systems that you put together and flows that you can run on FPGAs. And um, I, I would like you know, to ask, why are you mm -hmm. doing this? I find this incredibly exciting to be able to um, you know, develop hardware through your browser. I, there's so, I, I think this is a really, really exciting time to be in this field. 
personally. Um, I, so I started my career with Digital Equipment Corporation uh, over 20 years ago. And when I went into that ecosystem, you know, I felt like, wow, this is, I, I'm so fortunate to be able to go into the world designing the world's most advanced silicon. And right now, it, we're, we're at sort of this exciting period where for many years, it's been all about CPU design, which you learned about just now. And that's exciting. But now we're at a, at a space where CPUs aren't good enough. Uh, we have different compute workloads. We have artificial intelligence workloads. We have graphics processing. We're sort of at a scale where you need hardware that's optimized to your particular application. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of opportunity now for different architectures and mm -hmm. you know different hardware. Uh, and I think that's just extremely exciting, opening up all kinds of, of new opportunities. And um, that's everything for this video. Thank you very much to Steve for helping me to create this video. And thank you very much to you for watching. By the way, we are preparing some very interesting tutorials, so if you don't want to miss them, hit the subscribe button. If you want, you can also check out our Fedevel Online courses, where you will find everything important from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again. Don't forget to leave your comments and see you next time. Bye.